Welcome to another edition of Teach the Geek Interviews. My name is Neil Thompson. I am the founder of Teach the Geek. It's an online platform for science and engineering professionals. You can learn more about it at teachthegeek.com. Again, that is teachthegeek.com. Today, my guest is Joy Goswami. He works in academia and corporate engagement. To me, that means that his institution partners with industry to advance technologies developed at his institution. I'm sure he'll correct me if I'm wrong on that. He's also a director on the AUTM board with AUTM standing for Association of University Technology Managers. I'm interested to learn more about his role in corporate engagement and his work with AUTM. Welcome to Teach the Geek Interviews, Joy. Thank you so much, Neela. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. So from the bit of research I did on you, I saw that you uh, you got degrees in, in molecular biology. Where did that interest come from? That's right. So um, as you can tell, uh, I, uh, I'm not originally from, from the U.S. And actually, uh, I'm the first generation immigrant here uh, uh, that has moved to the U.S. about roughly 22 plus years now. Uh, so my formative education really was uh, back uh, in India. And I'm, I hail from New Delhi, which is, uh, as you know, the capital of India and a very, very populated city, almost uh, the population of New York City. So born and brought up there uh, and uh, because of the size of the city and the population of the country itself, it's a very uh, competitive kind of a, a space uh, that, that I grew up in. Uh, my family actually belongs to academicians. So my grandfather is a mathematician. Uh, my father was uh, also an academician. He was a scientist for many years. And so by uh, default, when I was born, I was only given one choice and to, that was to become an academician. And so when I eventually uh, was uh, was getting into um, uh, the situation where I was, uh, you know, kind of growing up, uh, I had either choose one of two choices: either you become an engineer or you become a doctor. So there is no third choice in a situation like that uh, in a family of academicians. So uh, I eventually chose to uh, become a doctor, uh, and uh, obviously the path to becoming a doctor isn't easy. So I took on biology as uh, my major in my undergraduate and eventually started uh, studying in that space. Uh, did not end up uh, choosing to become a doctor, but uh, a molecular biologist in general, which is basically, as you know, the study of genes uh, and uh, and the study of science that revolves all around with genetics uh, and evolution uh, and to do with, uh, you know, our, our general uh, uh, physiology based on, uh, on on biology, biological uh, nuances uh, at a molecular level. So, so what made you decide not to become a doctor? Well, it was competitive. So I've, I've got to be very, very honest with you. In India, uh, there is uh, the, the the spree to become a doctor. The, 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 the number of people that eventually end up becoming a doctor uh, it really depends on uh, an examination system. And it's very, very, very competitive. Uh, uh, not that I didn't try. I tried, tried my best, but just was, wasn't successful. But like many other things uh, in, in this world, everything that happens, happens for the good. And hindsight, I think I'm, uh, I'm privileged to have an education in, uh, and, and, and a career where uh, I, I fathom become being uh, in a space that I'm not a doctor, but I'm kind of serving the population and are, are serving humanity in a different way. You know, Joey, you... <laughs> A few, maybe a couple of years ago, I had a guest who was from Greece, and she said it kind of sounds kind of similar. They have this national exam, and you take it, and it determines where you what what you can study in school. And I think she she placed in I think mechanical engineering, but she actually wanted to be an electrical engineer, but she didn't get a high enough grade, or I guess yeah, it, on that test to to be placed in electrical, so she had to settle for mechanical. It's just. For someone who's from this side of the world, this sounds kind of nuts. <laughs> the fact that you know that you can get blocked from doing what you want to do based on a, a test score. It's just wow. It's, it's so that's so unfortunate. But luckily, I mean, hopefully you ended up doing something that you that you like to do anyway. I mean, I saw that you got a, an MBA. What was the motivation for that degree? That's right. So as I become uh, uh, basically was taking the the, uh, the course of becoming a molecular biologist, uh, becoming a scientist was the natural progression. And like I said, because I come from a family of scientists when my grandfather was one and then my father was, I was sort of uh, uh, sort of leaning into becoming one. And uh, also, uh, you know, in a parallel life, I was very, very good uh, uh, at uh, uh, a skill that I had developed while I was a kid, which was singing. So I really wanted to become uh, an artist. As a matter of fact, my interest was to become a singer when I was young. 
But uh, for one reason or another, my parents did not allow that because they thought this uh, this kind of a career was uh, was really risky, and and that uh, being um, uh, going into the STEM field and becoming a professor or a scientist would be a much better route, short of becoming a doctor. So they eventually said, uh, no, I would could not become a singer. So I basically chose uh, to pivot and then becoming uh, a scientist. But, you know, in due course, again, as I was doing science and I was doing research, I, I continued doing that for a reasonable amount of time in, until my 20s. And then I realized that uh, there was one day, actually, I was doing a research where it was a very, uh, you know, personal kind of a feeling. Um, and much of my research was in the, in the molecular biology space where I realized that I was really doing something that I was not really wanting to do. In other words, sitting in the bench and doing research, uh, cranking out research results uh, for the society was something that did, just did not uh, feel as though it was my uh, cup of cake and that I really wanted to broaden my horizons to do something different. Uh, the good thing was that I had a very broad background in general. Uh, when I started off, and my father was very uh, keen in wanting to make sure that that background was broad enough that I could move around if I wanted to. And so I chose to uh, look into an avenue that was different from just to becoming a scientist. And, and it just occurred to me that there is so much of science that's going on around in this world that probably has applications, but doesn't quite see uh, any light at the end of the tunnel. In other words, the science is really confined to publications and research, but it really doesn't see any light where the common people like you and I get to use it. Uh, so there's gotta be something that's happening that uh, there's a lot that's getting missed out on. And so it kind of uh, made me inclined towards seeing what the business act aspect of that that was. Uh, so that also coincided with my uh, deciding to come abroad to do higher studies. And so, uh, again, the natural course would have been for me to join the PhD program, but because I didn't want to sit in the lab and do lab work, I thought, well, let me do something different. And the best uh, alternative to uh, doing anything in the science area was to get into business, which I eventually ended up doing. So I got a second master's in business, uh, and I really am happy I did that uh, uh, for a story that I'll tell you maybe later. <laughs> yeah, you know, that, you know, you're, you're certainly not the first person that I've spoken to <clears throat> who started off at the bench and, and got tired of it and, and chose to do something else. And, and many, it would seem, go into the business realm. I mean, I mentioned in the intro that you work in corporate engagement now. So can, perhaps you could tell us a bit about what exactly that entails and, and what really motivates you to get into that space. Right. So to move the story along here, and obviously, you know, nobody's story is sort of linear in the way it is written on your LinkedIn profile. Uh, you know, do, do you do all kinds of things? And uh, to move the story forward here, so once I completed my bachelor's uh, and then my, my master's in biology and then second master's in, in, in business, um, obviously it was high time for me to join the workforce. And so um, a profession that I was completely unaware of really came into sight, uh, which I thought uh, was a great fit for me. And that profession was uh, in the space of innovation uh, and uh, inventions. Um, so I basically joined a company after my, uh, my uh, MBA uh, that was working on uh, prosthetic devices. So it was basically a company that was uh, developed by a startup uh, individual who uh, uh, basically established the company as a startup. And uh, he was uh, in the prosthetic space because uh, the CEO of the company actually met with an accident and a motorcycle accident and unfortunately had to ampute his uh, his right uh, um, foot, so to speak. Uh, and then he was a below knee amputee. And uh, obviously that was a treacherous uh, story and, and he gives the story in a very nice way but eventually ended up starting a company around innovations around uh, medical devices for amputees. And so he generated and invented a machine that was basically a machine that was uh, um, an advanced technology from what most Bologna amputees usually wear as artificial limb, which is when they strap around with, with a belt and then move around and that ambulation is extremely tough. So he invented something called a uh, uh, a vacuum assist socket system, which is basically uh, an artificial leg, which sort of works in the with the principle where that leg um, uh, basically clamps to uh, the residual part of the foot through vacuum. Uh, 
Uh, and so he had that invention in mind and he eventually got that done. And uh, he hired uh, 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 a person who was my superior and myself to try and see if this technology could be uh, made commercial to the outside world. And so that got me into a space that was very unique because if you recall, I had a background in biology and then a background in business. And I thought that, you know, if I use these two skill sets of taking the biology side of things and putting uh, it in business, I could maybe assist this individual. And so that's what happened. I ended up, uh, you know, accruing a lot of information about what happens about these new kind of inventions in this particular case in the biomedical area uh, that eventually uh, would have to be taken to the commercial marketplace where everybody could use. So in due course, you know, as I was working with the company, I learned about, uh, you know, obviously the research side of things. I learned about uh, intellectual property and how you eventually patent things learned about you know, regulations, FDA approval, and then getting this technology to the marketplace, which eventually became a success. And so I got a, I got a taste of something that I really wanted to do and was also capitalizing on my skills in biology and business, where I was thinking of trying and taking newer ideas and inventions to the commercial marketplace. And, and again, I wasn't aware that this would, or this was even a, a possibility until I worked in this company. That eventually ended up me moving to another company. And this was a similar saga again. The inventor of this company had a, a machine called the liquid handling system, which was basically a robotic arm that was dispensing very small amounts of, uh, of liquid. And the application of that he wanted to use for research and development for what we call high throughput screening for people who do drug testing, except that the, 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 the machine was not developed enough and he eventually employed me. And again, this, the story was the same. The inventor got this new machine. He wanted to eventually make uh, it available for the public, for people to buy it. And everything that falls in between those two uh, points, which is an invention happens and it gets into the commercial market, is somewhere I found a very good niche, uh, uh, only to realize that this is basically a most sophisticated uh, uh, profession called the technology transfer professionals that do it. And so I really, you know, this was back in 2002, roughly 20 years now, I really got into the space and I got motivated to do this. And today, you know, one thing led to another and I'm uh, in, in a situation where I call myself a technology transfer professional, but I've expanded the horizons a little bit where my role is not just assisting with the inventions to become or get to the commercial marketplace, but to actually have companies uh, get involved in uh, the academic space where they can work with, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, universities, so companies plus universities, great ideas leading to inventions, which eventually will get into the commercial marketplace. So this entire scheme of things is where I fit, I find a good fit for myself. Nice. You know, maybe about 10 years ago, I was working at a, a small startup company and the boss wanted all the engineers, all three of us, to become patent agents. So you wouldn't have to outsource patent drafting to outside counsel. So I right. thought this was something that I had to do. Per apparently it wasn't because the other two people didn't do it. <laughs> I'm the only one that ended up <laughs> becoming, I'm the only one that ended up becoming a patent agent. And you, would you know that he still outsourced everything to outside counsel? So <laughs> I, was a, <laughs> I, was a patent, I was a patent agent with nothing to patent. It's like, man, you made me take this damn test and you didn't give me anything to patent. Like, come on, man. <laughs> this test was hard <laughs> it was hard and 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 since you're a patent agent and so am i you know how tough the test is as a matter of fact from what i hear is less than 50 percent eventually end up even passing the test so it's one of the toughest tests uh that you can uh eventually sit in even even to sit in it uh, uh takes a lot of guts which i presume you had <laughs> when you eventually took it on and um, and then passing it is a totally different story, and it sometimes takes multiple uh, chances to eventually get through it. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's a tough one. Yeah, I remember. What, so I did it on a computer, and then when I was done, I had I mean I had a, some time to go back and check answers, and I started maybe once I got to the tenth one, I was like, man, I'm done with this. Whatever, whatever the tenth, whatever the grade <laughs> is, it is what it is, man. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. It takes almost a year for even the preparation side of it so it's, it's not easy it's uh, you know cranking a 5000 plus page book called uh, 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 you know USPTO uh, it's meant to be for people who work at the USPTO and uh, and then that book has to be eventually almost learned by heart before you can even appear for the exam so it's a tough one 
So I compliment folks that do it and say hats off. And I don't know how I did it myself, but I think I was purely lucky. <laughs> you know, I also mentioned in the intro that you are on the board of AUTM. How did you get involved with that board? And I guess, what do you do as a member of the board? So once uh, I eventually, so let me just continue with the story here. So once I eventually decided that I want to be in this technology transfer space, um, I, I wasn't I wasn't sure which side of the uh, which side of the uh, story I would be in. In other words, there are two kinds uh, of tech transfer professionals: ones that work in the company sector, which I was working until then, and the other is that work in the academic sector. So um, immediately after finishing two um, uh, of my profiles in working in the corporate sector, I was just lucky enough to get into the academic sector and in a university that was doing a reasonably high amount of research, particularly in the agricultural space at that time. And when I did that, uh, I, I joined what what is now called the joining the technology transfer office in a university. So uh, as I joined, I realized that there is an association called the AUTM uh, uh, that is basically uh, an association which currently is more than 3,000 people uh, that have like-minded people uh, with folks that have a background like mine and that have an acumen to, to basically proliferate themselves in the tech transfer space, space like myself. So I find I found myself to be in, in, this, um, in this nice association where folks were all uh, uh, kind of thinking similarly and basically trying to assist with the uh, uh, researchers that have invented something cool to get into the commercial marketplace. So it, it's it's a little um, you know oversimplified when I say it. It's uh, just taking an invention and taking it uh, through and putting it into the marketplace for consumers to eventually use it. But uh, because of the fact that there are so many nuances and so many small little things that go into uh, making these this a successful endeavor. Uh, you know, the profession eventually evolved and Autumn um, um, is an association that eventually uh, have uh, folks that ha are in this space. Um, and this happens all behind the scene. Not too many people really even get to know. But today, um, as you as you may realize, there are thousands and thousands of technologies that's really in and around us, uh, including the Zoom that you're using, the laptop you're using, uh, you know, the physical space, uh, physical science space in the in the biological science space that eventually uh, take the course where an invention happened in the, in the laboratory by an academician and is put into the commercial marketplace. And Autumn has been a prolific association that has eventually helped uh, professionals in the space to uh, put uh, you know, the process together in a way that uh, is streamlined. And you know, they talk about best practices and basically share uh, you know, all the goodies and, and the frustrations uh, alike. So I've been associated with Autumn since uh, since the time I joined the academic space, and um, and you know sort of slowly moved my way up. It's a totally volunteer volunteering organization. We spend our time as volunteers, and uh, you know one thing led to another, and now I eventually I sit on the board uh, along with uh, twelve other members uh, that uh, steer most of the activities that uh, that go on with this this profession in general. What do you hope to advance as a member of the AUTM board? So mostly newer technologies, uh, getting newer technology into the marketplace. Uh, you know, just to give you a general example, uh, and, and I'll tell you these technologies, they're tough because these technologies are so early that, uh, uh, that these are uh, technologies that really do not have an application unless there's a real need for it. Uh, as an example, again, when COVID hit, for instance, uh, you know, we had this compelling need to get a vaccine into the marketplace. And to get that vaccine into the marketplace, it couldn't have been just one organization, just one university or just one company to do it. So the moment uh, those alarm bells uh, were uh, put together, um, Autumn came into action and everyone in the tech transfer field came into action and we all joined hands to, real, to try and steer the process of making vaccines available. And today you know that it took a record amount of time for the vaccines to be available. So the fundamental research was all there. It took something like a COVID crisis to get that technology from where it was in the lab into the, into the marketplace and then into our arms. So my, uh, my intent, my ambition is to make sure that such technologies eventually uh, you know, take shape um, in, in the way that it had taken for COVID 
And uh, if, if that can happen, and, and obviously sky is the limit with the amount of research that's going on with the universities, I think we can get uh, to a better place much sooner than it would be without professionals like us. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Joey, when I first started this podcast, it had to do with my own struggles in giving presentations in front of other people. It was actually in my second job when I was working as a project lead and that I had to give presentations in front of senior management and I wasn't very good at it at first, but I got a lot better at it because I didn't want to, basically I didn't want to be a sweaty mess every time I had to give one of these presentations. <laughs> you know, the CEOs in the audience, the CTO, the CMO, all the C's were there. So I, I wanted to make a good impression. And I think I eventually got, got to that point where I, I certainly wasn't sweating as much given those presentations. Like so I saw the benefit of it. When did you see the benefit of getting better at presentations? You know, again, I think I think it's it's the fundamental phenomena of every human being uh, to be able to communicate, right? I mean, we learn communication as as a baby uh, in whatever way we do it, and it's been you know evolutionarily, I don't know, hundred thousand years when human beings uh, actually started existing on the surface of this earth that they started to communicate. So communication is, I think, the key, and then eventually the progression happened and evolution has happened. Uh, you know, it used to be, you know, 30,000 years, years ago, people used to actually go into caves and they used to make drawings, idea being that they had to communicate. And nearly 10,000 year ago, years ago, it's um, it's learned that uh, languages came in play. And then nearly, you know, I think five to 6,000 years ago, when people started writing uh, on books and uh, and scriptures that we still have today. So it it, it changed from verbal communication to to communication where it is written and and uh, and documented, so communication is the way of life, and that I think every human being eventually understands. And if we weren't uh, able to communicate, we really wouldn't be humans. Um, so it's 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 a very uh, nifty, uh, um, obviously, tool for us to make sure that uh, we connect. And even today, you know, while I and you speak, you're on the west coast, and I'm on the east coast. I presume you're on the west coast, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so. All we are using is, is technology, but just the language that I'm using is enabling me to communicate to you and then to several of the audiences that may be hearing this podcast. So uh, I think that came very early um, and it came to me in two ways. Like I said, I just had a general knack for singing. So as a really small young kid, uh, I was exposed to going on stage and singing in front of an audience. And uh, uh, you know, this was when I was, I don't know, probably 10, 12 years of age. And then uh, because I was reasonably good at it, uh, I realized that this uh, is a me medium for me to eventually convey myself to people uh, in mass. Um, and so I, I just got uh, lucky enough to use music as a way to communicate. And then eventually that sort of transpired to uh, to something uh, of, of much more technical and much more educational value when it eventually got to a situation like uh, like me being have, having to uh, communicate to folks about let's say technology transfer yeah so, I mentioned... uh, oh, go, ahead. go ahead no no i just meant to say just to, to to circle back on your question here i think it's very important to eventually make sure that presentations are used because that's probably the the, the modus operandi for people to communicate best I mentioned that when I first started giving presentations at that second job that I used to sweat quite profusely before during, <laughs> and after the presentations. It And yeah. that obviously was a sign of, of my nervousness. Do you ever get nervous before giving a presentation? And if so, how do you deal with your nerves? I think in general, again, everybody gets nervous uh, when they present, but everybody gets nervous to do everything when they do it the first time. Uh, I, I just, I just, uh, I just would say that you know, I still recall the first time I spoke to my girlfriend. Uh, I was nervous like hell. It was way more being nervous than you know, being on stage and talking to or, or making a presentation to hundred people. So it's always the first time that uh, makes everybody anxious and nervous. Uh, it happens to me. It happened to me much more than it used to be, uh, you know, in the earlier days. For me, music helped me. So I started off really young to be in front of the audiences. But in general, I think I've found that uh, you can always get past your nervousness if you're confident with what you're talking about. So it's it's a matter of obviously practicing um, what you want to eventually convey. And, and, and look, when you're speaking to an audience, 
I think that the, the process is very similar to, let's say, typing an email. You know, you, you have an idea. So the first thing you have to do is to have a thought process and then you have to code it. So you write the message of an email and then you write to the body of the email, which is coding it. And then you have to hit the send button. It's really similar when you're speaking to somebody, to you or to an audience of, uh, you know, 50 or 100 people or even more for that matter. So the only thing you have to make sure is that when you're coding your 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 speech, which is packaging your 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 talk, it has to be decoded properly. So anybody who sees your email will first see the message to get an idea of what you have written about, and then read the email. And in the process of reading the email, decode it, and then respond based on how best the decoding was done. So I think the packaging of that email, packaging of the message, is really a key. So I really practice a lot on that that I'm sure that if I have to deliver something to an audience, and whether it's an audience uh, that's listening to my music or it's an audience listening to a podcast like this, which is around technology transfer, or an audience that wants to listen to me talking about uh, my journey in neuroscience as a researcher, I need to package it well, uh, being mindful of what my audience is and make sure that it is decoded well enough uh, in a way that they can eventually respond to my, uh, my my thought process. And I think if I've done that correctly, the nervousness kind of goes down and it comes with practice. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, for sure. Practice makes progress. If you were to offer one tip to anybody listening to this conversation or watching it on YouTube, what would it be? Oh, <laughs> You mean a tip uh, for communication skills? That's right. If they want to become a more effective present presenter or effective public speaker. You know, I think practice, practice, and practice. Uh, and, and I go, whenever I go for a talk, I would say, you know, keep in mind um, a unitary basis. So I do it on a unitary basis always. Unitary basis meaning that when I speak to an audience, whether I'm speaking to Neil Thompson or I'm speaking to a thousand people, I always... Uh, envision my audience to be one. Uh, so I, I almost make it feel as though it's it's a single person whom I'm talking to. And I think with the moment I think that that's what's happening, uh, my speech and my lecture becomes much more easier to handle. Uh, when I do that, uh, and I say it unitary basis, is because I say that I'm speaking to one audience with one clear message. Uh, and I, I map it out. So this is an audience I have and at the end of the day, the audience will have a terrible amount of attention deficit, but what they're going to eventually do by virtue of listening to me is have one take home message. So I joined the dots here, one audience, which is whom I target with one clear message. And when I do that, the road kind of always uh, goes through. So I think if somebody wants to address um, um, you know, a, a speech or, or, or a public, uh, lecture, or even for that matter, teaching a class, if they have that one message well uh, captured in, in the minds, I think the, the, the discussion eventually goes much more seamlessly. This is my <laughs> my version of, uh, of uh, talking about that one tip that you asked. Wonderful. Well, this was a great conversation. Thank you so much for being a guest, Joy. How can people get in touch with you? Oh, uh, you can just Google my name. Uh, it's a simple name, Joy Goswami. And uh, if you do Joy Goswami at Johns Hopkins University, or you do Joy Goswami uh, at uh, 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 and string it along with technology transfer, you'll usually find me. Uh, uh, so it should be easy to find. I have my website, um, and I'll be more than happy to share. But it's it's pretty much easy to just Google and find all the information. Along with the, the search, you get an email address and uh, and all of the particulars, uh, including my phone number, et cetera. So I'm in a public university in Johns Hopkins. And as all other public universities, I'm fairly easily available. Excellent. Well, everyone, that marks the end of another edition of Teach the Geek interviews. My name is Neil Thompson, founder of Teach the Geek. And you can learn more about it at teachthegeek.com. And again, that's teachthegeek.com. Until next time, take care and stay safe. Thanks, Joy. Thank you, Neil. Pleasure being with you.